This is the eternal struggle of a very single reader who continually reads about the drama of a main character who's in a love triangle. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cozy Corner. My name is Lee and this is my library. So grab a mug of something yummy and settle in for some talk of books. Normally I don't hype up Starbucks too much because I'm not really a coffee snob, but I have to say that their fall blend this year is exquisite. Uh, this is my second bag that I've bought <laughs> since it came out, so um, I am uh, loving it. So when I started my booktube channel, I was very optimistic about the amount of books that I would read. I had envisioned myself finishing all of my read everything on my shelves challenge by the end of the year. I was like, yeah, sure, I can pick up another challenge and add 12 more books to my list. And then September happened and I only made it through four titles. Uh, <laughs> I think the amount of books that I had to read versus like the amount of available time that I was going to be able to give them did not match up. However, October was a much better reading month than September <laughs> and I felt much better about uh, the titles that I read and the amount of reading that I got done. So without further ado, let's jump into the titles that I read and my reviews of them. We're going to work our way from my worst reviewed book to my best reviewed book. I mentioned in my very first what I read video that my five star rating system is a little bit type A. So if you want to refresh your memory on how I rate my books and what each of those star ratings mean, all that information is down in the description. Death by Pumpkin Spice by Alex Erickson. This was actually the last book I finished in October, but it is the lowest reviewed book I've got this month. So this is a cozy murder mystery and it is a part of a series called the Bookstore Cafe Mysteries. This is not the first book I have read by Alex Erickson. He has, um, at least to my knowledge, seven of them out. I'm sure there's probably more since um, I've started reading them. I have already read the first two in this series, Death by Coffee and Death by Tea. This is part of my Read Everything on My Shelves challenge and I have two more, t no, three more titles after this one. I'm currently in the middle of reading the next in the series, Death by Vanilla Latte. And then the next two are Death by Eggnog and Death by Espresso, I believe. And the plot of this book is kind of unique. <laughs> so Chrissy, who is the main character, she owns Death by Coffee, which is the uh, bookstore cafe in question. It's what this whole series is based on. And she stumbles across a murder every book. She's sort of an amateur sleuth. In this particular story, she is invited to a sort of hoity-toit Halloween party by her date who is a doctor his name is Will and he's one of the love interests in this story and so she goes to this party expecting to be kind of out of place because it's full of rich people who couldn't give her the time of day and she's correct and about an hour or so into the party a death happens and they discover that the victim who had been strangled and had her head smashed through a pumpkin, <laughs> which I think is probably the most Halloween-ish death that you could possibly have, um, they discover that she was the girl who earlier in the party had been proposed to and she turned the guy down and insulted him and fled the party. So everyone was like, oh, well, it must be the fiance. And so Chrissy and the one police officer who is at the party, who is the other love interest in this story, yes, there is a love triangle. She and Paul is his name. Uh, do their best to solve this mystery and a whole bunch of spooky content ensues there is a rich widow there is the burned lover there is the estranged husband and daughter who mysteriously meet up at the party there's a whole but oh there's a gun for hire that also shows up at the party there's a whole bunch of stuff and in the meantime Chrissy is trying to determine her feelings between Will who brought her to the party who is a very cute doctor and Paul who is the very cute police officer trying to solve this mystery all of this takes place in a massive, huge mansion that is Halloween themed. So the guy who owned the mansion, his favorite holiday was Halloween. So every room in the house has some sort of Halloween theme to it, which makes it extra spooky. So it was the perfect seasonal read. Things I loved. I love a good holiday themed read, um, particularly Halloween. Halloween is my favorite holiday. And it was really awesome to see this all sort of play out in this big, huge mansion that was spooky themed. I also enjoy the drama that comes from pretentious rich people. I think that makes great content. Really excited for Bridgerton coming out on Christmas Day on Netflix. Julie Andrews narrates it like Gossip Girl. I actually had tears in my eyes when I watched the trailer on Netflix. You should go watch it. 
Anyway, other things I love. I really love a good love triangle. Not a cheesy one, but like a genuine one. Um, this one, it's a cozy mystery, so like sometimes it's a little cheesy, but I really like Will and Paul both as love interests. I also love that Chrissy's need to be sort of the amateur sleuth and <laughs> she'll freely admit in these books that it comes out of her need to be almost unintentionally nosy. <laughs> me. I do not gossip, that's not healthy, but uh, I do enjoy a tidbit <laughs> or two. <laughs> However, I don't think the circumstances of this murder were very plausible. So once the victim is found, which of course Chrissy finds, Paul, who is the only police officer at the party, oh I should mention, it, uh, during this party it's also a massive thunderstorm, it's chucking it down raining, and Paul is the only police officer at the party. None of the other officers from the police station are able to get to the house because of the rain. So Paul basically demands that all of these guests, about which I think there's like 50 or 60 guests in the house, he demands that all of them stay in the ballroom or in the house and no one is allowed to leave until he figures out the suspect. And this whole thing lasts the entire night until the early morning and in my mind, my logical mind, I'm like, there's no way with one police officer you're going to keep all of those guests in the house. Like, it would have been very easy for the murderer to escape. So that part didn't really seem very plausible to me. I also think the premise of this whole murder plot was a little hard to follow. The ending, which I will spoil a little bit, does have a twist to it, but I would never have called that in a million years and it didn't quite, at least in my mind, match up with the amount of stuff you read in this book, if that makes sense. So like the whole plot of it, I think didn't really match up with the ending very well. In most murder mysteries, I really like knowing why someone would kill the victim. Like make me hate the victim, <laughs> which sounds kind of dark, but I want, I want you to give me a reason why multiple people would have wanted to kill this victim like that to me speaks so much more because it automatically makes the story juicier and you're almost overwhelmed with the amount of people who could have done it that's what i love to see i want to know why the victim was killed i want it to be a reason that i'm like in my mind i'm like oh yes this is why this many people would kill them that didn't really happen in this book really the only thing that would have prompted this victim to have been killed was her rejection, very rude rejection of the marriage proposal. And really the only person who could have killed her would have been her would-be fiance. And that really wasn't enough to justify her murder. And ultimately that isn't why she was murdered. Uh, it had nothing to do with the proposal. A little bit of a spoilers, there was a huge plot twist at the end and sort of the culmination of why this girl was murdered took place in the last two-ish chapters of the book and I didn't think we needed to spend this much time in the book trying to get there. It felt like a lot of wasted effort for an outcome that had nothing to do with what they were talking about. It was like he at Alex attempted to have the, that level of Agatha Christie misdirection but it fell short of the mark. It, it almost felt like I was wasting time reading all of these different avenues that Christy and Paul were going down only for it to happen within like the last-ish chapter. Also, for the love of God, can she just make a decision between the two love interests, Will or Paul? Pick one. They're both great. I just want her to make up her mind. This happens with every cozy murder mystery series I read. There's always a love triangle. That being said, this is a series. So as far as I know, he's got seven. I'm sure there's probably more, like I said. And while I love a good holiday-themed book in a series, Typically, in my own opinion, they aren't the best. He has definitely written better installments of her story. I am currently in the middle of Death by Vanilla Latte, which is already much better. Someone gets stabbed through the eye with a pencil. Like, that's amazing. And <laughs> I'm hearing myself. <laughs> I don't think this is Alex's best, but I genuinely enjoy his other installments of the Bookstore Cafe Mysteries, and I really like Chrissy as a main character. And I have to tell myself to remember that I can't judge a series by my least favorite book. It does add color and expands character development. It's what it's here for. So overall, I'm gonna give Death by Pumpkin Spice by Alex Erickson a two out of five stars. Next book that I read in October is Ruby by Francesca Leah Block and Carmen Staten. <sighs> This book took me forever to decide what I thought about it. 
I was left with such a myriad of emotions at the end that I could not it literally took me until this morning to like finally sit down and sort out my thoughts because there was so much happening in my brain about what I thought about this book and unfortunately when I finally did like sit down and select what I wanted to say about this book I ended up actually disliking it more than liking it which is unfortunate because when I was reading it I really enjoyed it but it wasn't until I reflected on it that I was like mm, there's actually quite a bit more in it that wasn't up my alley. So this is a uh, fantasy romance book that follows the story of Ruby, who is a girl that has the knowing, is how they describe it in this story. Which basically means she sort of has a sixth sense about her destiny, and she's also able to communicate with trees and nature, and she has what I guess I would call it magic. She's able to do magic. And basically she comes from a very traumatic past, and at a certain point in her life, she comes to realize that her soulmate is somewhere out there in the world whose name is Orion. And she also discovers that Orion is a Hollywood movie star. And so she goes on this journey to find him and fall in love with him so that they spend the rest of their lives together and it improves her life greatly and also to learn more about magic. That's kind of the premise of this book. This is one of the books from my 12 Tropes of 2020 challenge. This fell into the soulmate trope that was one of the suggestions for the challenge. And that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> Ruby on her journey to find her soulmate, Orion. I do want to say, before I continue my review of this book, and it is something that I am trying to do more often when I do reviews or when I talk about these books, that there are several triggers in almost every book with the exception of Death by Pumpkin Spice that I'm gonna talk about. So this book um, definitely has some child abuse and sexual assault triggers that are incredibly traumatic, even for someone like me who has never dealt with anything like that. It was hard for me to read. Childhood abuse is something that really does not sit well with me. And so it was hard for me to read. And so I just want everybody to know that if you do pick this up, please go into this book knowing that that is what happens in this story. So I loved the flashback setup of the story. It's told in flashbacks. So we get a present day moment of Ruby and then a flashback of Ruby, and then maybe another flashback, and then moves back to present day Ruby. And interspersed throughout those flashbacks and present moments are first person narratives of Orion, which are all in italics. And it's just sort of how their stories intermingle with uh, Ruby's narration of her experiences with being abused, and then also her interactions with nature. She learns more about the gift of magic that she has. And normally, I really struggle with that kind of style of the plot being broken up into flashbacks, if that makes sense. I really like a sort of smooth read and if you're able to incorporate flashbacks cohesively and it makes sense, then I really enjoy it. But for most of the time I find like it interrupts my flow of reading, but this one was really good. I think it's because it is so short and it's almost episodic in how it reads that the sections are maybe like four or five paragraphs long at most and then it moves on to something else so right away it's set up that like this is almost like a jigsaw puzzle of putting together Ruby's life. The imagery in this book is gorgeous. The way Francesca describes things was beautiful and I'm so glad I read this in October. It's dark and spooky and like just the right amount of witchcraft aesthetic well <laughs> to sort of break up the darker heavier parts. It was really really beautiful to read. However, I think that witchcraft part was the hardest part for me to sort of get on board with. There was no explanation or setup of how Ruby discovered she had magic or did she learn it somewhere? Was it inherited? Like there was no setup of how she came into magic. There was also very little explanation as to the kind of magic she had or how she suddenly knew so much about it. Like there was no like education form of how she figured out or learned about the magic she had, nor was there any explanation of why it existed. And then I mentioned in a reading vlog, I think it was that when she first discovered Orion and felt this compulsion to be near him, it all of a sudden switched into crazy fangirl mode. Like that's how it read to me. She researched him, she looked up his likes and dislikes, she looked up places that he visited, restaurants he liked, and she basically transformed herself into 
a girl she thought Orion would like. Now in my mind, I'm like, that sounds like a crazy person. <laughs> um, because I mean, if you had the gift of knowing who your soulmate was, like the whole point of soulmates is they'll love you unconditionally. And so given the empowerment part of this book, I would have thought she said, well, I'm just gonna find him and we'll see what happens. But she fully transformed herself into someone that she thought Orion would like. She, he was a Hollywood movie star. So, you know, most of that stuff is public knowledge because of interviews. But then she also found out who his family was and she <laughs> went to England where his mom and stepdad lived and moved to that small town, got a job at his mom's apothecary. His mom also has magic. Got a job at her mom's apothecary and basically just lied her way into his life. And that to me did not match up with the whole soulmate, soulmate thing. Like, yeah, she had a compulsion to go be near him, but that storyline of her doing those things really made me question the validity of her having this ability to determine her soulmate. And the other thing that I wish we would have gotten was more backstory into who Orion was. In the little first person narratives we get, we understand that there's some major drama between his mom, his dad, and his stepdad, and his true parentage. And it was only maybe like one or two mentions and a brief explanation as to how that all happened. And I really wish we would have gotten to know him more in this story. Granted, it's very short, so there's only so much room for him because it's mostly about Ruby. But it would have been nice to know more about how he operated and his motivations behind how he lived his life. Also, a little bit of a spoiler, so plug your ears. <laughs> I think the ending was very odd in this book. Basically, after Ruby goes back to the States because her own dad, who was the person who abused her and her sister and her mom, he passed away. She left to the States, didn't tell Orion that she was leaving. They'd known each other and been intimate with one another at this point. But she basically went to go to his funeral, but then also felt so guilty that she wrote all of this down in a story form and sent it to him via email. <laughs> and he read it. And I would have expected Orion, because he is a Hollywood movie star, to react negatively by thinking, oh, this is yet another person who wants to take advantage of me and be close to me for power and fame. Like, that's how I would have expected a human reaction to be. But it magically all worked out. And again, that was another point of the romance that didn't really make sense to me. I would have expected a longer drawn out her trying to appeal to him and him coming to understand her and more about who she was and the pain of her past and that kind of thing. But nope, it just sort of resolved itself within a chapter. I will say that the part I loved the most out of this book is the story of Ruby's experiences with childhood abuse and sexual assault. Throughout the book, a lot of the flashbacks deal with moments of her dad abusing her, her sister, and her mom, as well as her dealing with a stalker ex-boyfriend and the emotional abuse she received from him. As dark as that concept may be, I really think that this would be an amazing read for someone who is motivated to read books that are about stopping the chain of abuse. This narration of that of her experiences with abuse and assault had a beautiful climax um, it, at the end of the book. It was awful, don't get me wrong, but that part of the story played out so well and it was a beautiful first person narration of the self-empowerment that can come from someone who decides to stop that chain of abuse and says, this has been continuing in my family for so long, but it stops with me. And Ruby is the embodiment of that. And I think for someone who wants to read that kind of thing, who needs inspiration, or needs a healthy response to childhood abuse, this would be the perfect book for them. And it, it breaks it up with sort of the fantastical fairy tale part of their story. But I think overall that this type of book isn't something that speaks to me, which is why I give books like this a two rating, because I think it's meant for a different audience than me. I enjoyed the book, I thoroughly did. Like I said, in the middle of reading it, I was really sucked in to what was happening in the story but I don't think I'm the intended audience. And so I would definitely recommend this for people who need this type of literature because this I think will do wonders for them. Overall, I think the redemption arc of little Ruby as she travels through her life 
was my favorite part, being able to see her take charge of her own life and say, this isn't what's gonna happen to me. I think that was my favorite part. And I do think that this will speak well to other people, but to me, the rest of it was questionable, which is why I am giving it two and a half out of five stars. The next book that I read in October is finally The Selection by Kiera Cass. This book has been on my TBR for five ever. I didn't actually have it. I was planning on checking it out from my library. Then I found out they didn't have it, so I had to order a used copy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really glad that I finally got around to reading this. When I received this book in the mail, there was a cute little note written from the previous owner that said, thank you for buying this book, Lee. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> this book is also part of my 12 Tropes of 2020 challenge. This covers the love triangle trope. <sighs> what book doesn't have a love triangle in some form or another? That's an exaggeration, but a lot of fantasy books do. It's a great plot motivator. So this is a futuristic fantasy, and I would probably also maybe classify it as a romance. This is the first book that I've ever read by Kiera Cass. I know, I think there's, she has five actual novels that all follow America, who's the main character. They all follow America's story and a multitude of novellas that sort of add bits and pieces where there are plot holes missing. So I am overall excited to read the second in the series. It will probably be a while before I get to it, but I really enjoyed this book. Again, another trigger warning. This does not happen to the main character, but in here there is a character that is affected by past sexual assault and um, has some very obvious PTSD. So if that is something that triggers you, I would just give you a little bit of warning before you pick up this book. I really like America Singer as a character. I think how passionate she is about her life and how she wants to remain true to who she is is incredibly notable and noteworthy in this story. I really, really like her, especially because she is someone of a lower cast of people. I think she's a five, if I'm remembering correctly, which is the entertainment cast. So they sing and they play instruments and they are hired by higher upper cast people to perform and entertain. And so even though her cast level is raised to a three, I think once she becomes a part of the selection, spoiler alert, but that's the whole point of the book, um, she still wants to perform and entertain because she genuinely is passionate about the life that she leads. And I think that's really admirable. For her, there is no begrudging the fact that this is the life she leads. There may be some moments where she chafes a little bit at the sort of lack that her family has, but she is ultimately genuinely invested in the type of skills that she has, which I think is really admirable. I also did not expect to be solidly on one side of the love triangle. I am a huge fan of Maxon, <laughs> who is the prince. I think he's sort of like the perfect innocent combination of, as of now, I don't know what happens in the second book, it could swing the other way, but uh, as of now, I think he's sort of the perfect balance of a young prince learning how to rule and then also learning how to speak the language of women for the first time. <laughs> and I get frustrated along with America about the fact that she has 35 other girls who are competing and vying for his attention. And he's just right now such a lovable person. I just want to hug him all the time. And I think <laughs> um, he's also an incredibly strong character. And I really love the relationship that America and Maxon have which is open and honest. And the first meeting they had, he said, why are you you know, panicking? Why are you so emotional? She says, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be a part of the selection. And from that, they form a sort of unlikely friendship and they ask each other questions and they're honest with their feelings. And it, I love that. I love that both of them recognize that this is almost an impossible situation. And yet they both sort of agree to still be friends, even if that happens. And then of course, they maybe fall in love a little bit. I won't spoil too much of this because it was good. Uh, I didn't have any problems with the ending like the other two. I am not a fan of Aspen. It was such a shallow butthead thing to do by saying, Amer oh, I should say Aspen is a cast lower than America. So if they were married eventually, she would have to be the next, she would have to revert to the cast that her husband was. And so Aspen was like, you need to be a part of the selection. You need to do this. If you don't take this chance, I'll feel like I kept you back from something. And then of course, inevitably she gets accepted to be a part of the selection. And he says, 
oh, well now it's impossible. I don't know why we ever did this. Now we can never get married, goodbye. <laughs> and I was like, hold on, hold the phone. You're supposed to be the supportive person who loved her unconditionally. And then you put her in this impossible situation. And then of course, because she's a great human being and Maxon likes her and says, yes, of course, we like you. Come be a part of this election. You say, ah, no, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm never gonna be good enough for you. Forget everything, forget that we told each other we love each other, goodbye. <laughs> I kind of anticipated one of them doing that. So now I'm staunchly on Maxon's side because I don't like manipulative people. And then she had just moved on from him in the palace and was finally getting used to and maybe even slightly enjoying life in the palace. And then he shows up as part of the guard. They always do. <laughs> as soon as you move on, they always come back. On top of the pressure she's dealing with with trying to figure out what her relationship is with Maxon and learning how to be a princess and to rule a country, along with the pressures and the treachery of the 35 other girls, the ex-lover has to come back and make life even more difficult. And he's already demanding her time and attention. Girl, bye. <laughs> I am gonna give this book a three out of five stars, even though I enjoyed it, because I think there are elements of this that are not necessarily borrowed, but I've read them before. It didn't really feel like a truly original story plot idea to me. So a lot of this reminds me quite a bit of the pre-Hunger Games time when all of the tributes are spending time with, oh, I'm gonna forget his name. Anyway, I'm getting a lot of that because the girls in here are interviewed and put on live TV so the um, people of the nation can get to know them. I also think because of the Hunger Games and also several other books, the numbered human cast system is a trope that's been used before. I was also getting sort of a cocktail of the Trill trilogy by Amanda Hawking and the Princess Academy trilogy by Shannon Hale, basically about girls dealing with the pressures of being thrust into royalty when they don't want it. I even get a little bit of divergent vibes because of the way that this version of the United States came into being and also the stories that I've been hearing about the rebels that are in this book which attack the palace like every other week <laughs> um I'm almost getting a little bit of divergent vibes from that and I think because this isn't a completely original idea or to say it a different way I've read so much other material that has elements like this I'm only going to give it a three but overall I thoroughly enjoyed it I had no problems with it whatsoever which is why I'm giving it a three, which is a good book that everybody should read. However, even though I felt that way, I really enjoyed this book. I think Kiera's uh, an incredible, incredibly clear communicator. She's a great storyteller. There was never a moment when I was disinterested in this book. So if you want a good futuristic fantasy with a good dose of romance, pretty clothing, <laughs> some sort of gossip girl vibes with the other uh, members of the selection, then I would highly recommend this book. The next book I read in October was Above the Bay of Angels by Reese Bowen. This book was brand new this year and it has gotten many, many rave reviews. Reese Bowen is a well-established author, New York Times bestseller. We'd love to see it. <laughs> but this was the first book I ever read by Reese Bowen, even though I have heard of her before. She specializes in historical fiction. And this one in particular is historical fiction, but it also has some mystery and some romance elements in it. So this book is also part of my 12 Tropes of 2020 challenge. This one uh, covers the mistaken identity trope. This book follows the story of a girl named Isabella Waverly, who is a destitute aristocrat whose drunk father basically makes her, in order to make money for their family, become a service worker. And I think she starts out as a scullery maid in this aristocrat's house and then eventually uh, works her way into the kitchen and becomes very interested in cooking as a career choice. And one day in London, she stumbles across a girl who has just gotten in an accident, run over basically by a carriage, and whose name is Helen. And Helen has a letter from Queen Victoria hiring her to become an under chef in Buckingham Palace. And Helen hands her this letter sort of as a way to say, like, please deliver this for me. Or I don't exactly know what Helen's motivations were because she didn't last very long after that moment. 
but Isabella or Bella for short finds this letter as sort of like a turn of fate and so she assumes Helen's identity and goes to work in Buckingham Palace. And then the blackmail starts. She establishes herself as a young female. Everyone's surprised that she was hired as a chef as a girl because this is Victorian era England and girls don't do that. <laughs> um, but Helen's brother is the one who finds her, or excuse, yeah, Helen's brother is the one who finds her and blackmails her. And the drama that ensues, someone dies, there's some romance. It's some good stuff. And before I continue with this review, there also is another trigger for this book, some sexual harassment. Um, if you have any trauma relating to that, there is some of that in here, as well as some drug references. So if you struggle with that or are a recovering addict, then uh, just be careful. So also while I was writing these reviews, I realized that France has been a huge part of what I have read this year. <laughs> I read Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the last book that I'm going to talk about in my October 2 read. Uh, is based in France. This also is based in France. Isabella basically travels with a certain retinue of Queen Victoria's kitchen staff to Nice, to the hotel that they have built for Queen Victoria. That's her vacation spot, and so she is allowed to go with them to Nice. So much of France has been a part of my year, which I love because I love France. So the beginning of this book was set up really well, and within the first few chapters we had the whole premise of the story ready to go, and it was like we've reached the top of the initial main hook, main incident, and now we're ready for the story to begin. And I really liked Bella as a character. Uh, she reminded me a lot of Anna Bates in Downton Abbey where she's sort of viciously independent and fiercely loyal but also really has a gentle soul. And so I really, really liked her as a female lead. I also really love all the rumors that surround Queen Victoria and her tendency to say, nope, I'm the queen, we're doing it this way. I love to see it. <laughs> I think Queen Victoria is a hoot. And while she always wants to be taken seriously, I think she has a really great sense of humor. I think Reese did a really good job of incorporating actual historical events into her story. Often I find with some historical fiction that some events it's just described and we're sort of taken out of the story to experience this, that moment in history, but they were almost of secondary importance in this book. Not that they weren't important, they were, but they were still told from Bella's point of view and how she would have reacted in those situations, and I think they were set up very well and that it wasn't implausible for her characters to actually be there, so I really appreciated that. I think there were probably three weak parts of this story, at least for me as the reader. The first has to do with the romance aspect of this story. So she has several people who are interested in her, Bella does, and I never really was super passionate about any of them. <laughs> um, yeah, they didn't really move me in any way. She does end up with one of them and it does change her story quite dramatically, but I was never really emotionally invested in him or their relationship. And it wasn't like it was a bad ending. I thought it was great. I just never really had any emotional investment in him. The second part that I thought was a little bit weak was the sort of anticlimactic nature of the mystery or the murder mystery that takes place in this book. Initially, after I read the blurb and I knew someone was going to die in here, within the first five chapters I had figured out, at least in my own mind, who I thought the victim was going to be. And then the victim, the actual victim, the method of murder and who did it were complete surprises, but the whole premise of them figuring it out was incredibly anticlimactic considering that Bella was an active part of it. Um, and I never really was on the edge of my seat of like, is she in danger? Who's, how are they going to figure out who did it? Um, again, it wasn't bad. I just wasn't overly invested in it. And then I think the part of the book that let me down the most was the blackmail aspect, which is the whole point of hype in the blurb, that someone had found out that she was an imposter and was going to blackmail her. Like I said, it was Helen's brother who came and blackmailed her. He shows up in England first and then several times throughout the rest of the book, but I never really felt the blackmail was very intense. Like Bella as a character was never pushed to desperation or experienced a low moment because of it. And then at the end, it resolved in a way that was almost too clean. She never had to deal with any fallout or mess from the fact that she had taken this girl's 
identity. However, I am giving this book a three and a half out of five stars because ultimately I really enjoyed the story. <laughs> Even though I've, I have read better climaxes in this type of material, I really enjoyed the story and was invested in who Bella was as a character. I super appreciated the woman empowerment. I had never realized that Queen Victoria was such an advocate for young women taking higher ranking jobs. Like she pushed for women to be able to support themselves. Didn't know that about her. Love that element in this story. And you get a real slice of who she was and she actually speaks in this story and has interactions with people and especially Bella and I really liked being able to have a glimpse into her life and her own struggle as being a female monarch and ruling alone. This is after Albert, Prince Albert has died and she's on her own again and her passion about being a woman of status and wanting other young women to feel the same way. So even though I really enjoyed the story, I am mostly giving it a three and a half <laughs> out of five stars for that reason alone, that it was a good read a good short read. This one I think was probably the one that took me the least amount of time to get through. I just have read better climaxes. <sighs> we have come to the final book in what I read in October and it was by far the best book I have read in a long time. <laughs> it was so good. It took me two and a half weeks to get through the entire thing. It is Revolution by Jennifer Donnelly. It's so good. I am giving it four out of five stars. Now you might be wondering, Lee, why aren't you giving it the full five? Like, come on, if you love it so much, then it deserves a full five. We'll get into it in a little bit. But for now, I am giving it four out of five stars. This is one that I picked up at a garage sale we had several weeks ago. I did a bad thing and bought more books, <laughs> even though I told myself to stop doing it so that I could read all the unread books on my shelves, but I couldn't resist because uh, I love the trope of... <sighs> did you hear that? <laughs> I have my leaves candle going and there were a bunch of bubbles in the candle just went... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, I love the trope of two different storylines happening about the same subject that are centuries apart. So it's a modern day character who discovers like a diary or a journal or something about another character way before them. I love it. It's so good. And within the first three chapters, I was so invested in Andy, the main character. I'm getting off track. I've written all my reviews down and I'm so passionate about it this book <laughs> that I've completely forgotten any of it. Okay, back up. This is Revolution is a historical fiction. And I also would probably maybe classify it a little bit as romance, but it mostly only happens with the modern day character. And it's kind of a secondary plot point to what actually happens. So mostly I've classified as historical fiction. This is the first book I have ever read by Jennifer Donnelly and now I really want to go find more because <laughs> it was so good. So the plot of this book follows two characters. The first is Andy who is our modern day character. Andy is a dark and moody teenager uh, who unfortunately has to deal with the trauma of losing her younger brother and then also deal with the issues of her estranged parents. Her mom has not dealt with the death of her younger brother very well either and has some very severe mental struggles. Her father basically left them, abandoned them after her little brother died. Her father is an incredibly renowned geneticist and is called to France to research whether or not this petrified heart that they have discovered in France is the heart of the young prince Louis Charles, who is the Dauphin after Marie Antoinette and King Louis the 18th, I think, were executed during the French Revolution. And they want to know if this is Louis Charles's heart of whether he did die in the tower where he was kept prisoner or whether he escaped and this is someone else's and whether he went on to live his life in freedom. Annie's dad comes back and basically launches his agenda that he has launched several times before that living with your mom isn't healthy, you can't study music in college, you need to figure something out, get your life straightened out, get your senior thesis done. And so he drags her to Paris with him and uh, gives her an ultimatum and says, if you do not finish this by the time we are done with vacation, 
then I am not paying for college. And she basically says, fine, then I'll get it done in three days so I don't have to spend any more time with you. And then she discovers a guitar case. <laughs> um, the people who they are staying with who are good fan friends of their family. Um, the husband is a historian and loves relics, especially about the French Revolution. And he has many museums. And so he has this sort of warehouse where he lives full of all this stuff. And Andy, who loves guitar, she's fascinated by guitar, finds this guitar case and inside a journal of a girl named Alexandrine, who is the other character who lives during Revolution era France. And Alexandrine is the playmate of Louis Charles. And the second half of this story follows Alexandrine's, Alexandrine's journey to, or from being poor and destitute, being Louis Charles's companion, living with them in the palace, them being attacked and taken out of Versailles, being imprisoned, her being separated from Louis Charles once his parents are executed, and then her drive to get him out of the prison that he is being kept in. <sighs> That's the overall plot. There is a huge plot twist ending, would not have called the ending of this book, but the stories meet together in the end in a full circle way that reminds me quite a lot of how I felt about Queen of the Night, another book set in Revolution era France. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of that ending where it was so bittersweet, but it was full circle, so you didn't really care that it was sad. But <sighs> the plot of this is so good, I could spend hours talking about it. So I do want to say that this book has the most, out of all of the books that I read in October, the most triggers, I think. It has a lot of suicidal references, a lot of attempts at taking someone's life, and a lot of drug references. So if that is something you deal with, please know that that's a big part of this book. So if that's not something you're ready to read or ready to deal with, I would maybe wait to read this. I have <laughs> a very, this book is so heavy to hold up. I'm gonna put it down. I have a big obsession with the French Revolution. I think it's a very fascinating time of history and it was such a turning point for that country that they never really recovered from, to be honest, but I find it so fascinating. And I learned quite a few new things about the French Revolution. There was a prison in here that was ransacked and basically all of the aristocrats were pulled out into the courtyard and slaughtered and chopped up and burned. <laughs> Not a great visual. And then the other part that I didn't realize was that there was another method of execution where they would chain um, a bunch of aristocrats, men, women, and children together and chuck them into the Seine and basically drown them into the Seine. And it's it's hard for me to read that kind of stuff. I am fascinated by the revolution, but it was such a huge loss of life that it makes it hard to read about. But I also really enjoy learning more about that period in history and how even though the bourgeoisie sort of fought against the aristocracy, they also suffered after the revolution happened. No one was sort of better off after this whole thing had happened. And it's more about the country's realization that like, oops, <laughs> we may have fixed one problem, but we created 50 more. This book kept me so invested. And like I said, I struggle with flashbacks, but I think concepts like this, where I know it's an established character and it's two stories that will eventually relate to one another, not just a flashback that needs to explain something, but it's, two stories being merged together. I love the interplay between Andy and Alexandrine. I think that was so well orchestrated. I did not call the ending. It freaking blew my mind, but it was so good. And like I said, <laughs> it was a full circle bittersweet ending. It was not a happy ending, at least in my opinion. Um, there were some happy elements and a f some of the stuff I wanted for Andy, I wanted her life to improve so much. Some of that happened, but it was more bittersweet than happy. Like I said, like Queen of the Night, I don't read a lot of those endings. And for whatever reason, I'm really developing a taste for them that this is probably more like what it would have been like in real life. And I find that I'm appreciating that more than having ultimately a happy ending. This was the first book I read in October. I think I actually started it at the end of September, but it was the first one that I welcomed October with. And it was so dark and so twisty that I think it was a perfect seasonal read. Now you may be asking yourself why I'm only giving it four out of five stars if five is like my ultimate and I'm ranting and raving about this book. The only reason why I am not giving it five out of five is because five out of five is my I will continue to read this till the day I die. That's my tier. <laughs> and because of how dark and emotionally 
charged this book is and the material that you're dealt with, I don't think I would ever want to pick this up again unless I had a real hankering to read it. I'm going to highly, highly, highly recommend anybody who loves historical fiction to read this book. Just in general, anybody read this book. Everybody read this book. <laughs> That's what the four star tier is for. This is gonna be a recommendation that I tell everybody to read. I just don't think it reaches five because of how dark it is and because I won't want to read it again. I don't think. It was a one and done. <laughs> it's such a twisty plot and it will definitely keep you on your toes. And I am so glad that I read this and discovered Jennifer Donnelly and I can't wait to read more by her. So that's the end of what I read in October. It was a great reading month. I read some books that I really loved, found some new authors that I'm interested in, and read some that pushed me out of my comfort zone, which is good because that was one of the goals I started this channel for, was to expose myself to new material and read stuff that pushed me out of my comfort zone to expand my taste in genre. That definitely happened this month. It's now November. We're at the end of the first week of November. I've got some good books that I'm reading. Spoiler alert. One of them may already be a five star. I started with a good one straight out the gate. <laughs> and I've got some other great ones that are coming up uh, on my to read list. As always, thank you for coming to Lee's Library. If you have read any of these books, please let me know down below. What are your reviews of them? Are any of them on your to be read list? Do you have any other suggestions of books written by these authors? I would love to know. If you would, please like this video and subscribe to Lee's Library. It would mean so much to me. And it also lets me know what you guys wanna see. As always, a huge thank you to those friends and family who have readily supported me along this journey. I can't wait to see what's on the next page. Cheers.